The picture you're looking at was painted by the Flemish artist Adrian van Stalbent in the first half of the 17th century. It shows a collector's gallery, halfway between an art collection and a cabinet of curiosities. There are paintings, musical instruments, and many other artistic objects, all carefully depicted in praise of the cultivation of the arts. You'll also notice a rich selection of shells, corals, and other natural objects, which together with the globe, the maps, and the measuring instruments, celebrate the wonders of geographical exploration and the novelty of exotic nature. From the dazzling perpetuum mobile on the table on the left of the picture to the maps and shells on the right-hand side, this painting is a treat for us historians of science. Looking at these fine details, one can sense the curiosity and wonder associated with the discovery of new worlds and the study of new physical phenomena. My name is José Ramón Marcaida, and I'm a visiting scholar in the Department of History and Philosophy of Science in Cambridge. My research focuses on the use of images in science. I'm trying to find answers to questions such as the relation between images and knowledge and interconnections between science and art. I look at the 16th and 17th centuries, a time of extraordinary social and cultural change, the age of exploration and discovery, the development of print culture, great expansion in the sciences and the arts. I look at the ways in which people recorded the natural world and its phenomena centuries before photography, images of plants and animals published in books, illustrations of foreign lands and peoples produced by explorers and expeditions. I also look at paintings and how they depict knowledge about the world. Today, we tend to separate the arts and sciences and study one or the other, but in the 16th and 17th centuries, people didn't make these separations. That's why I look at the wide range of visual materials to discover how the role of artists art collectors and patrons fits into this broader narrative of science. Let's focus on one particular item on the table on the right, the bird with green and yellowy feathers. A great deal of my recent research has been devoted to this bird, one of the most famous curiosities of the natural world, the bird of paradise. If you're familiar with David Attenborough documentaries, you will know the bird of paradise originates from New Guinea and the surrounding islands and is famous for its colorful feathers and its fancy mating dances. In the period that I studied, the bird was also famous for another reason. People believed it had no feet. For many years, the only specimens that reached Europe were dead, desiccated birds with amputated bodies to preserve the beautiful plumage. This fact, together with the stories told by explorers and sailors about these birds of God, as they were called in their native lands, gave rise to a complex symbolism which saw the birds as heavenly creatures in permanent flight detached from life on Earth. This bird of paradise symbolism was soon incorporated into European visual culture. At the beginning of the 17th century, birds of paradise were portrayed in paintings such as this representation of Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden, where the bird of paradise is depicted without feet flying above the rest of the animals. Historians of science have recently started studying paintings like this one in order to learn more about the interaction between artists and naturalists and the kind of visual sources they used. Take a look at this splendid rendition of the bird of paradise by the great expert in animal painting, Franz Snyders, painted around 1630. The bird of paradise is standing on the branch of a tree, on its feet, surrounded by other birds some of them also of exotic origins. This painting is an interesting testimony of the early modern taste for natural themes portrayed at vivum, from life, with a high level of detail. It also reflects the interest in first-hand experience and observation. Let's consider one final example, the adoration of the Magi by Peter Paul Rubens, now in the Prado Museum in Madrid. In my most recent work, I've been looking at the representation of the bird of paradise in this painting. Look carefully at the head of the black mages, one of the three wise men. His turban features a large plume, but is it an ordinary plume? On close inspection, I realized Rubens had painted not just a plume, but also a head and a beak. Having seen many images of the bird of paradise, the shape and the color looked highly familiar. It is indeed a bird of paradise. What does the bird represent in this context? On the one hand, Rubens is referring to a long tradition of ritual use and trade. Back in their native lands, the birds of paradise were highly prized commodities. 
Local rulers were reported to wear them on their heads during battle to grant them protection. In Indian Ocean trade, their feathers were valued for ornamental headwear. This association with the East, with the figure of the Oriental, probably tell us why Rubens decided to include this exotic bird in his portrait of the most exotic of the three wise men. On the other hand, the emphasis on the figure of the black mages reinforces the central theme of the painting, the epiphany as the recognition of Jesus' divine nature by people from all over the world. In the context in which the painting was produced, a moment of intense political and religious conflicts between European powers, Rubens' work can be seen as a pictorial claim for the primacy of the Catholic Church and the imperial interests of a Spanish monarchy. The Bird of Paradise is just a small detail in this massive painting, but a fascinating one. The painting is a very good example of how the study of the visual culture of science can help us to understand the wider context in which the arts, the sciences, commercial or political interests interacted in this period. Paintings are great resources for the historians of science, and for anyone interested in the visual dimensions of knowledge. I hope my research helps us to bring together museums and research institutions and foster collaboration across disciplines.